So uh, today is Wednesday, September 1st. Uh, we are picking up where we left off. We did not get a chance to fully finish our discussion of mitosis at the end of the last class. So we're gonna start with that right off the bat uh, and then get into the actual topic of what we were supposed to talk about today, which is the plasma membrane. Uh, so we will discuss that uh, big circle we put around the outside of the cell and all of the fancy things that go along with that. Uh, for lab today, as we were just talking about before I started the recording, we have that practice lab exam. One last opportunity to make sure you are uh, doing all of the appropriate proctorio things correctly, scanning your area, having your area clear, doing all the fun things that are necessary for that, making sure your machine is compatible. And the other advantage of this practice lab exam is you're going to get to see the exact format of how the lab exam is going to be and with questions that could easily be on your exam. As I've said, every single one of these questions is a question that I've had on previous exams in my 15 years of teaching this. And so um, it's a good opportunity to gauge how your studying is going uh, to see if you need to modify the way you're attacking the material to be more successful when it counts for real. You then have a whole week off. Monday is a holiday, so study hard, work hard. Uh, we've got a ton of material to cover, uh, so make sure you're comfortable with that. When we come back on Wednesday, uh, you've got three homework assignments due that are going to be very time consuming. Uh, as we were just talking about, the Labster, while not hard, uh, can be time consuming. The Physio X, if you haven't been working with that yet, again, not hard, but can be time consuming. Uh, and then, of course, your unit reviews. Now, all leading up to Monday the 13th when we have our lab and lecture exam. All right, so any questions on our game plan? Excellent, stunned silences, that's always what I love. All right, so we left off last time and we were working our way through the process of uh, mitosis and cytokinesis. And Augustina, this would be a perfect opportunity to ask your question as we lead into that material. So, okay, so in the G2 phase, when you're replicating the centrosome, and then that becomes the spindle fibers, right? Great question. Yes, absolutely. So, uh, again, uh, one thing I do want you to be careful about is that the production of that cent second centrosome actually starts uh, in G1. So in G1, we start forming the second centrosome. And then the formation of that second centrosome is then completed in G2. And once it's completed, that is actually the trigger that actually starts the mitotic phase. All right, so again, if we think of this in simplest terms, as we know, the centrosome is made up of two perpendicular tubular centrioles. And as we've also talked about, we know it is surrounded by a cloud of dense matrix uh, known as the centrosome matrix. And then as we also know, their other name is the microtubule organizing structure. So as mitotic phase begins, what this centrosome starts to do is it starts organizing microtubules around it in this star-like fashion. And these microtubules that are forming around it are also referred to as the spindle fibers. And ultimately these spindle fibers connect to spindle fibers from the other centrosome, or as we saw, they're gonna connect to, as we see in the pretty picture down here at the bottom, they're gonna connect to the kinetochores on our chromosomes to move them around. So notice what they're trying to represent here at the beginning of the process is two of these centrosomes with those little star bursts of the spindles starting to form around them as they move around the cell. Okay, so I guess that that's my question. Like that's what I'm confused about. So I thought the centrosomes were the microtubules, so they're not the microtubules, they're just Centrioles are made up of microtubules, but remember, they're also their function is the microtubule organizing center. They're not the only microtubules uh, that are found inside of the cell. And so they are going to start organizing. I mean, that's kind of why I purposely used a different color. They are organizing other microtubules to form our uh, star shaped spindle fibers. Yeah. 
I don't know if you can actually connect directly to the, um, let's do this. Hold on a second. Don't know an easy way to get to that other than this. I'm sorry, every time I, I'm on my phone right now, but every time I go to the teleconnect and um, zoom on my computer, it says request data invalid. So I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know if you can do it directly or if you have to do it through Canvas. So that again, this connect tech is, so that's the link that it shows me. So I don't know if that would help, but you could try that. But other than that, I think you might have to go through Canvas. I don't know with the tech connect zoom, that's a new system for us. So I don't know uh, how, what the requirements are for something like that. All right, uh, Augustina, did I answer your question? Kind of. Okay, well, I'll tell you what, what we needed to do, because remember, we went through this together uh, on the board, the whiteboard with us, but then as promised, I want to go through it a second time. So let's go through a second time and see if that second time using the prettier pictures from the textbook help. All right. Uh, oh, there's one last thing that I wanted to talk about when we talked about cytokinesis, and I mentioned this because you are responsible for recognizing this on plant cells as well. Remember, on a, in cytokinesis for an animal cell, we have that actin ring that causes the pinching of the cell that form that cleavage furrow that we talked about. Right, So that was how that actin ring keeps pulling and pulling and pulling until it divides the one cell into two cells. Plants are slightly different. What will happen with a plant is they start to take these little vesicles with a little bit of the cell wall structure, and they will start to form a little line in the center of the cell of cell wall called the cell plate. And then the cell plate continues to expand bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until finally it divides one cell into two cells. And make a point of emphasizing this because you're gonna to need to, under the microscope, be able to recognize these stages. And one of the easy ways to tell telophase in the plant cell is you start to see that cell plate that is forming in the middle. So as that cell plate starting to form, it makes it easy to recognize that you are in uh, telophase because telophase is when you're knee deep in cytokinesis as well. All right, let's go through these processes again and see if this helps, Augustine. And if not, then we'll make sure that we make sense of it before we move forward. Here we see our cell. Uh, and again, as we talked about during interphase, uh, we have, oops, we have a, a nucleus that basically is just a cloud of chromatin, right? Notice all of our DNA strands and our chromatin strands are just all loose. Uh, there's a nucleolus because it's being read to make uh, proteins. Uh, the nuclear envelope is intact and everything else that's going on is going on. It's doing all of its normal stuff. However, as we mentioned, once we produce, uh, complete the production of that second centrosome, that is what is going to tr uh, trigger the beginning of mitosis. So in the beginning of mitosis, remember there are three main processes that begin. The first of those three main processes are the ones that Augustina was talking about. Our centrosomes are going to start to produce uh, uh, spindles. And again, spindles are just made out of microtubules. And these microtubules, as they can see, start pushing away from each other. So basically what happens is our centrosomes uh, start to migrate to opposite sides of the cell. What we call the poles. So that's what we're seeing here. These centrosomes being the microtubule organizing structures are arranging microtubules inside of the cell and pushing away from each other by doing that, moving towards the opposite sides of the cell. Of course, two other events start to occur as well. Our loose chromatin starts to fold up 
into our tightly packed chromosomes. Now, again, we see that in the pretty illustration that they've done for it, but we've got this colorized picture here, this colorized light microscopy that we're looking at. It's actually a fluorescent light microscopy. And notice, unlike before, now, instead of just a uniform cloud of material inside of the nucleus, we can actually start to see some irregularities. We can actually start to see the uh, chromosomes starting to form. Again, if we go back a picture, notice, oops, just smooth, clear, uniform nucleus, because it's just that big cloud of genetic material, big cloud of chromatin. But now chromosomes are starting to form and we can see that irregularity of it. Notice also we can see the two centrosomes and their spindle fibers that they're forming as they're starting to move away from each other. And then also the third thing that starts to happen in early prophase is if we're going to be able to move these things around the cell, we need to break down the nuclear envelope. So notice when we look at this fluorescent image, we can clearly tell the difference between interphase and early prophase we can start to see how there is uh, some irregularity. We can start to see the chromosomes that are forming. We can see that the centrosomes are starting to move away from each other. There's two of them, they're moving away. But notice while there's chromosomes, they're all still tightly compact in the nucleus, in that nuclear envelope. Notice the difference here between early prophase and late prophase. Notice in late prophase, we can clearly see that those three processes that began have now finished. Notice our two centrosomes are at opposite sides of the cell from each other. Notice our genetic material is now fully condensed down into chromosomes. And notice that those chromosomes are no longer tightly packed inside of a nuclear envelope. They're now spread out throughout the cell. So again, if we go back, we can see uh, here it's contained in the nucleus. Here, the chromosomes are starting to form. Here, the uh, centrosomes are starting to move. And in late prophase, or as I mentioned, what some people now call prometaphase, those three processes have completed. So they started in early prophase, they end in late prophase. But notice one other thing as well. Not only is late prophase about ending these three processes, coming to the end and completing these three processes, but remember one other big important thing happens during late prophase. And that is some of our spindle fibers are gonna cut are going to attach to the kinetochores of our chromosomes. One from this side. Notice we're missing one. This one has to come and attach to here. This one's going to need to extend out and to catch to that one there. This one's got it already on both sides. So our chromosomes have that kinetochore, that special protein that allows the spindle fibers to attach to them. And once we attach to them, then we're gonna be able to move these chromosomes around inside the cell. So again, our nuclear envelope is gone. Our centrosomes have reached the poles. Our microtubule spindles have formed and they have connected to the kinetochores. Is this, do these images, these better images help at all, Augustina? Um, kind of, I went back and rewatched your like older lessons to kind of grasp the idea more. So I don't know, I guess I'm just confused on like what the centrosomes actually do. 
So what they do is they cause the formation of these proteins. They take these tubulin proteins and use them to make the spindle fibers. And as you can see, some of the spindle fibers are gonna go from one side to the other side to help to stabilize and stretch out the cell so that it can be divided. Whereas some of these protein fibers that they're making are gonna be the ones that are going to adjust and move the chromosomes around inside of the cell. So once they reach, um, once they reach the end, like what happens to them? Do they just disappear or? I'm not sure I understand you. You mean when they reach like, the goals? Yeah, no, like on telophase and then cytokinesis, do they disappear after that? Yes. So actually a great question. Uh, during anaphase, when they're pulling the chromosomes to the opposite side, that's when those spindles will start to break down. And then they continue to break down as the cell is divided into two. So yes, these are proteins. These are bricks that you're building to do some function. And then as soon as you're done with that function, you're going to knock it down because you don't need it anymore. Okay. And then during, so then like during regular, I guess like Regular During a regular function of the cell, there's no need for spindle fibers. These spindle fibers are only used during mitosis. Okay, but what about the centrosomes? Because I thought that's different. Yeah, well, the centrosome is sitting there inside the cell while the cell is doing all of the normal functions, but it's not doing anything. Okay. It's just okay. hanging out, waiting for the next time the cell needs to divide. Okay, that, that makes more sense now. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Uh, did I see someone raise their hand? Was there another question? Nope. Okay. Well, hopefully that means I answered it. All right. Excellent. All right. So we've attached these spindle fibers to our chromosomes and they're again, with no nuclear envelope, they're now spread throughout the cell, but we need to organize them. And that is the function of metaphase. Metaphase is when we're going to be able to dynamically build up or break down the spindle fibers to move the chromosomes all to the center. So if we cheat and go back, notice to move this purple one here, what we're gonna need to do is we're gonna need to break down this spindle to make it shorter, to bring it this way. At the same time, we're gonna need to build up this spindle fiber so that it pushes it forward. So we're gonna push this one and pull this one, the opposite here. We're going to break down this one to bring it this way, and we're going to build up this one to push it that way. And so with this push and pull, this breakdown and this building up of the spindle fibers, what we're able to do is line up all of the chromosomes right along the center of the cell, what we call the metaphase plate. So we get this jostling of the chromosomes so that we line them up in the center of the cell. All right, and so we get all these nice little X's all lined up in a row. This is a pretty short process. It's the fastest of all the phases and it's pretty rapid and pretty dynamic. Now, remember when we're looking at these chromosomes and I'll cheat and I'll just draw it this way. There's one sister chromatid, there's a second sister chromatid. And remember they're held together in the center by a special protein called the centromere. So once everything is lined up, yes, Amanda. Um, what breaks down the spindle to make it shorter in order to, for it to come towards the middle? There are special enzymes that help in the building up and breaking down of the uh, microtubules. Okay. Yep. Again, remember all of these things we're talking about in this class, all these physiological processes have dozens, if not hundreds, of you know, enzymes and proteins and other things that are involved in this process. Remember this class, the sky is blue, right? We're just doing as complicated as all these processes are as we talk about it. Every single thing we talk about in this class in reality is far more complicated about it. I mean, think about it. Every single one of these topics like mitosis, there are scientists who have spent their entire academic career just studying you know, mitosis. So obviously everything is, is in far more depth than we're talking about, but we're, we're, we're doing the simple sky is blue version of all of this stuff. Okay. All right, once we get everything lined up on that metaphase plate, then remember what we're going to do 
is we then get an inactivation of that centromere. The centromere breaks apart. And once that centromere breaks apart, then the two individual sister chromatids are now finally separated from each other. And when they're separated from each other, remember we now call them daughter chromosomes. I guess I'm gonna have to move this whole thing. And these daughter chromosomes are now pulled towards the opposite side. So what happens is these microtubules rapidly break down. And as these microtubules rapidly break down, they pull the chromosomes towards the poles of the cell. Yes. Um, are they also known as diploids? Or am I thinking of something different? You're thinking of something different. Okay. So these daughter chromosomes, oops are being pulled towards the opposite sides of the cell. And again, it tends to give the chromosomes a very distinct V shape, which is a bit of a giveaway that you are in that uh, anaphase phase of um, mitosis. All right. Now, one more thing I want to remind you about, we'll come back to it again at the end, but remember also at, as we are nearing the end, uh, yes, Stephanie, go ahead. Um, so this only happens though, like the daughter chromosomes only happens when um, the cell divides though, right? Like during cell divide. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, because hey, if you think about it, at it, so this cell before, let, let's go back a step. Technically, how many chromosomes does this cell have right here? Not our cells, but this illustration of a cell has four, exactly. So technically, this cell has four chromosomes. Technically, how many chromosomes does the cell have right here? Eight, exactly. Right now, the chromosome actually has twice as many chromosomes as it's supposed to have. But the reason for that is because we're going to divide this cell in half. And when we do that, we will then have two cells with four chromosomes, which is what we want. So you've got the right idea. At this point in time, when they're being pulled apart, when we have those daughter chromosomes, our cell actually technically has twice as many chromosomes in it as it's supposed to have. But that's because we're getting ready to physically divide this cell in half. And that was the other point I wanted to make. Remember, as anaphase continues and these chromosomes start to move further and further apart from each other, then remember at that point is when we're gonna to start to get that squeezing of the actin ring uh, that is gonna to start to cause that pinching of the cell forming that cleavage furrow as we get to mechanically uh, divide the cell in half of that process of cytokinesis. Uh, Stephanie, did you have another question or was that the first one, the, one, the original one? Sorry, yeah, the original one, I put my hand down. Excellent, Aubrey, you had a question? Yeah, I had a question. So yep. when, you call it a chromosome. So when it's just a singular, it's been pulled apart. Mm -hmm. You can call it a chromosome or, or a chromatid. No, great question. When they are connected, again, anatomists and their, and their vocabulary, when the two uh, pieces of identical genetic material are held together by the centromere, then this whole thing is considered one chromosome. And since it's two copies of the genetic material, we need names for the individual pieces. So, well, that's huge. Uh, so this is a sister chromatid and this is a sister chromatid. So two chromatids make one chromosome. Okay. And okay. Then... But as soon as we pull them apart from each other, as soon as these things are pulled apart, we get rid of that protein and they're starting to get pulled towards the opposite sides. Now that they're no longer connected, each individual one is considered its own 
um, each individual one is considered its own chromosome. Okay. So that's why they're now called daughter chromosomes. They're daughters because they contain identical pieces of information, right? Okay. There, there is no difference between a daughter chromosome and a sister chromatid. They're the exact okay. same thing. The only difference is whether they're connected or whether they're pulled apart. And that's the only difference. Okay, thank you. Yep, great question. And is that the maternal DNA? I know it's all the DNA. Again, this it's is this DNA. is yeah, this is a cell. This is a somatic okay. cell. So this is all the DNA. Okay. All right, excellent. Now, as it's being pulled apart, we're in anaphase, but as we talked about, when it gets to the opposite sides, uh, once it stops moving, then that's when we enter telophase. And if you notice, as we talked about, telophase is kind of similar to prophase in reverse. We are going to start to reform a nuclear envelope. But notice we're not just reforming one nuclear envelope, we are reforming two nuclear envelopes because we need to form two nuclei. Notice our chromosomes are starting to unwind to become loose chromatin again. And notice now that we have loose chromatin again, we can actually start reading that chromatin to make proteins. So a nucleoli may start to form. And at the end of telophase, and again, that's one of the keys, at the end of telophase, we have two nuclei. We started with one nucleus, we have two nuclei. Notice we don't have two cells, we have two nuclei. But notice, and uh, Agustina, give me a second, I'll finish this and then we'll, uh, I'll, I'll answer your question. At the same time, cytokinesis is continuing to occur where we're dividing the cell in half. And once it finishes dividing the cytoplasm, then our cell is now divided into two and we now have two physical cells. So at the end of telophase, we have two nuclei. At the end of cytokinesis, we have two cells. Yes, Augustina, your question. So I know that we've mainly been talking about like the separation of the nucleus and stuff, but like once all of this is done, is everything like separating all the organelles at the same time too? Because that's like what, yeah, cytokinesis is separating the, the cytoplasm as well. That is correct. So at the end of this, not only do we have two cells, but each cell has some Golgi apparatus, each cell has a rough endoplasmic reticulum and some smooth endoplasmic reticulum and mitochondria and everything else. Yeah, so cytokinesis, remember, as we talked about, cytokinesis is the division of the cytoplasm. Whereas mitosis is division of the nucleus. Okay, but is each one like, is each cell once it's during the process, is it just like cutting all the organelles in half and then putting them one in one? Or are they like fully making new organelles in each cell? Well, remember way back in, way back in G1 of interface, that is when we are making uh, more of the cytoplasm. That is when we are making more organelles. Oh, okay. So that we have enough rough endoplasmic reticulum to make two cells. We have enough Golgi apparatus to make two cells. We have enough mitochondria to make two cells. So way back in G1, we were making, because remember, as we, when we talked about G1 is when the cell's getting bigger and it's getting bigger because we're making all of this more organelles and more cytoplasm so that the cell is, when, when it divides, both cells will have enough stuff to be alive and to be functional. Okay, but we should just mainly focus on the nucleus? No. Mitosis is focusing on the nucleus. We cannot forget that cytokinesis is occurring. Cytokinesis just doesn't have as many elaborate steps to it. Cytokinesis is basically form that actin ring and squeeze the cell apart until it pops into two. So it's just not as elaborate of a process. So it doesn't have as many steps. We don't have to give it four different steps with four different names and everything else that goes along with it. It's a pretty simple, straightforward process. 
but it is equally important because as we talked about, if cytokinesis doesn't occur, then at the end of this process, you just have one cell with two nuclei. And that's not what we want. We want two cells. So yeah. cytokinesis, while a simpler process, is just as important. Okay. Okay. Amanda? Um, yeah, so the actin ring, is that the microfilaments? Like, uh, um, actin, yeah. the same thing? Okay. Yeah, remember, yeah. You remember microfilaments are and actin rings and actin filaments are the same thing. So absolutely. Again, okay. exact same thing by convention, which again, remember is a rule that people make up. Uh, they typically tend to call it an actin ring. Uh, of again, but calling it a, a microfilament ring would be perfectly acceptable as well. Okay. All right, excellent. Any other questions? All right, perfect. And so again, there we go. Again, telophase, we are reforming nuclear envelopes, two of them plural, membranes plural. Our chromosomes unwind to become loose chromatin again. We can start reading uh, that genetic material so nucleoli can reform. And again, at the end of telophase, we now have two fully formed nuclei. But and then each one still has a centrosome so that it can then on its own repeat the process when necessary. Exactly. Okay. Yep. And then physically, Mechanically, we are going to divide the cytoplasm, divide the cells with cytokinesis to split it apart into two. And we end up with two fully complete cells where we had one fully complete cell before. And again, after this process, we have two cells that are identical to each other and also identical to the original. All right. Questions on that? All right, excellent. Then that is the process of mitosis. And like I said, you've, I know you've got a labster that deals with this process uh, and other resources that again, if you're still struggling with this, take a look at your textbook, take a look at the other resources that you have uh, to help you to understand these concepts. Uh, again, um, there should be plenty of tools that hopefully can help you with that. Uh, did you have another question, Amanda, or were those hands the hands that were up from before? Uh, yeah, no, a new question about Labster. What if we want to redo it just to like refresh it and do it again, just so we can interact again? You, um, uh, it, I have Labster set up as a learning tool where you should be able to complete it as many times as you want. And because I have it set up as a learning tool, uh, it what should be submitted is your top grade. So if you got a if you got a 90 on the first time and you got a 70 on the second time, you're not going to be penalized for that 70. The 90 is still your top grade. And so you'll get full credit for it. I mean, I mean, after it's already been um, due and graded. Yeah, I can do this many yes. times as I want. OK, my understanding sure. is you should be able to do it as many times as you want. OK, good. Okay, Augustina, did you have another question as well? Uh, yeah, just a quick one. Yep. So. Every single like every single type of specialized cell in our body goes through the same process but when does that cell like become specialized like in the skin or like heart that type of stuff so great question so you've got the right idea uh almost every so obviously when we think of it from like an embryo when an embryo is dividing those new cells that are being formed are basically just omnipotent stem cells that can become anything eyeball cells liver cells toenail cells all of those things Mitosis is occurring in your liver right now. And so those liver cells, when they divide and produce new liver cells, they then remember enter that G0 state where they're just gonna do liver things for a while. And then after about a year, they'll start to get ready to divide again. Uh, your skin cells, on the other hand, spend little to no time in that G0 state. So as soon as it makes one, uh, two new skin cells, they start to get ready to divide again. Uh, and lastly, as we talked about, remember when the cells mature, some cells like your nervous system cells, uh, like your cardiac muscle cells, uh, once those finish dividing, making the ones that you have and all the ones that you have, they enter that G0 state and they never leave it. So that's why when you damage that neuron in your brain, it can't be replaced. 
right? When you damage that cardiac muscle, it can't be replaced because those cells are no longer capable of dividing to make new ones to repair it. Did that answer your question? Um, yes and no. So like for skin cells, like what makes a skin cell? Like, is it just a protein or special enzymes within it that like make it keep going in this cell cycle or no? Okay, got it. I, I so, um, yes, primarily it, because of its location, the chemical signals that are there are what determine what that cell is going to become. So absolutely, when that cell divides, the chemical signals that are in that environment in your skin are what determine that it's going to become a skin cell and then continue to become a skin. Uh, for a time, there was research where they were taking stem cells out of the skin and trying to change the chemical signals to see if we could get those stem cells to produce other things instead of skin cells. So is it truly just the chemical signals or as you're talking about, is there something special about that cell that says it's just gonna be a skin cell? And it turns out there may be a little something in there says it must be a skin cell. They had some kind of mixed results. They maybe were able to get it to divide to become other types of cells, but for the most part, uh, it pretty much is what it is. By the time we've reached the mature, mature state, your skin cells are going to be skin cells, your liver cells are going to be liver cells, and so on and so forth. So there, there, there's a predetermination to what those cells are going to be based on their location. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Excellent question. Any others? All right, perfect. So then let's move on. To our last major, uh, well, not major, our last major anatomical uh, characteristic that we need to talk about, and then some more physiology, and that is our plasma membrane. For our cell, when we've talked about the cell, we've talked a fair amount about the nucleus and what's going on there. We have now talked a fair amount about the cytoplasm and what's going on here. So what we need to do now is talk about when we draw the cell and we put this circle around the outside, what actually is going on there with that plasma membrane. So that's what we need to focus on now. Now, as we've talked about, and let's actually cheat, go to our whiteboard for this. When we have talked about our plasma membrane, what do we know is the primary component that makes up the plasma membrane? So the phospholipids? Excellent, is those phospholipids. Excellent. Now, I'm sorry, say again? Bilayer. Exactly, there's phospholipids and they're arranged in a bilayer. Excellent, so we know that means that they're going to have, um, let's go ahead and just make these black. A circular head unit. We'll put three of them here for starters. And then those two phospholipid tails. And of course, this is one phospholipid layer. And so as we said, it's a bilayer. So down here is going to be a second series of phospholipid heads and phospholipid tails. And what is it that is so special about these phospholipids that make them so useful uh, for forming our plasma membrane and why they have this specific arrangement? Um, the hydrophilic heads, um, they're water loving, so it's able to transport. Exactly. And then they... Well, be careful. It isn't so much that they're able to transport, but you've got the right idea. There are polar heads uh, to them. And those polar heads, because they're polar and water is polar, and we know that there is a ton of water here outside of the cell and a ton of water here inside the cell, that it allows it to interact with uh, the uh, water in, and the stuff in the water, both inside and outside of the cell. Uh, 
However, we, like I said, we want to be careful about transport because these tails are nonpolar. Right. They're like lipid fats. Yeah, they're the fatty acids, exactly. So we've fat got these nonpolar, we've got these nonpolar tails, which help to form this protective barrier to limit yeah. what can get through, what can get in and what can get out of the cell. Yes, Stephanie. So these polar heads uh, contact the inside and the outside of the cell, the fluid inside it. Okay. Correct. And that's why we have this bilayer arrangement so that the polar heads can interact with water and the stuff in the water outside the cell. This over here is the outside, let's say. But the two together control how much comes in and out, correct? Uh, yes, because of the nonpolar tails. The nonpolar tails, basically these are what form the barrier that limits what's able to get in and out. Because something that likes water isn't gonna be able to just shoot on through because these are gonna keep it away keep it out, keep it in. All right. So this is definitely something we've talked about so far and hopefully we are comfortable with, but it turns out uh, phospholipids are not the only lipids that help to form the plasma membrane. Now, if I had a glass of water and I were to take some vegetable oil and I was to very carefully pour that vegetable oil onto the, onto the, cup, uh, onto the water inside the cup, what would happen? It would stay at the top. Yeah, it would spread into a uniform sheet along the top of that water. And when it did it, would all of the individual oil molecules just find a location where it was happy and it would sit there forever? No. No. These are constantly moving around. And the same thing is true for these phospholipids. These phospholipids actually have the ability to change places with each other. So for instance, these two phospholipids can actually change uh, positions with each other. Or these two can change positions with each other. We call this ability of the phospholipids to be able to move around, we call this a fluid mosaic. There's this fluid mosaic of these things being able to move around. This is good and this is important for the uh, for the, some of the function of the plasma membrane. But if these things were too loose in their moving around, would it really form a good barrier stopping things from getting in and out? No. No. And so what we're able to do, if you remember our friend cholesterol, cholesterol is made up of those four carbon rings we saw, and then a functional group associated with it. These cholesterols, uh, basically can form because they're nonpolar, will embed themselves in the fatty acid tails region of our plasma membrane. So now if we were to label these heads, these phospholipids, which phospholipids are more likely to change positions, A and B or B and C? A and B. Right, A and B, because this cholesterol is located in there to help to provide more structure and provide more stability. And so that is another very important uh, uh, component of our plasma membrane. So not just one, but two different lipids uh, that are found here to help to form part of our phospholipid bilayer. Yes, Augustina. So if someone has high cholesterol levels, does this like inhibit the phospholipids to like move? Great question. No, in that case, it's a different type of cholesterol. That cholesterol is a cholesterol primarily found inside of the blood and the blood plasma. So there are different types of cholesterol. And that's why when we people talk about high cholesterol, there's really different types of cholesterol. And even in your blood, we have high density and low density cholesterol and things like that. So there's lots of different types of cholesterols. This is a specific cholesterol associated with the plasma membrane. And typically, whether someone has high or low blood uh, cholesterol levels, it typically doesn't affect the plasma membranes of the cell. Okay, I didn't know that. Thank you. Yep. No, no, no problem. Excellent. So that cholesterol helps to provide a little bit more stability. 
by locating in that space. However, lipids are not the only component that we find inside of our plasma membrane as well. They're also carbohydrates. Uh, these carbohydrates tend to be located more on the outside. Does that mean that there can never be any of them on the inside? No, of course not, but they tend to be located uh, on the outer surface. And so for these, we'll change colors and make them green. Uh, so again, we can, I'm drawing circles here in what should clearly be carbon rings, but you guys get the idea. Uh, there can be carbons that are located on the outer surface, or some of them could actually even be connected to uh, the cholesterols located here. And then we have those uh, sugars on the outer surface. Why might we have these sugars on the outer surface? What might a useful function of these things be? Energy. True, we definitely use sugars for energy, but if we're putting these on the outer surface of this cell, are they necessarily providing a lot of energy for the cell? No. I mean, I guess it could be storage for bringing it inside, but that isn't necessarily going to be the function of it in this case. Definitely, it does serve an important function of energy, but that's not Attraction necessarily- Attraction for proteins? Use. Uh, okay, I like the idea of the attraction. You got the idea. So one, one of the functions of these and, and a particular type of uh, sugar in particular is what we would call a glycocalyx. Glycocalyx is one type of uh, uh, carbohydrates that are located on the outer surface of our cell. And just like your hand, when you get sugar on your hand, what happens to it, your hand when you get sugar on sticky. the outside of it? So sticky. It becomes sticky, absolutely. So this helps to anchor it and attach it to other structures, stabilizing it in place. So absolutely, one of it is to add that adherence, make that sticky, help it to hold it in place in the tissue. But there's one other function as well, right? Again, as I mentioned after today, you've got a whole week off. That is a perfect opportunity to take a vacation to Vegas. And so you go to jump on the plane to go to Vegas and you have your black rolling bag. And because you made these plans last minute, you're in the last boarding uh, group. And when you get on there, they say there's no more room for your bag. So they're gonna have to check it for you. So they take it and they check your bag and you get to Vegas and you get to the luggage carousel. And when you're sitting there at the luggage carousel, how many black rolling bags come down that uh, luggage carousel? A lot. A gajillion of them, absolutely. So how do you know which one is yours? Okay, color, but if they're all black rolling bags, that doesn't. Right, you put the bags on them, absolutely. Or you put something on the outer surface so you can recognize it right? Mine, I've got a big, huge One Direction sticker, right? And a big orange bow. And so those allow me to easily recognize my bag. So notice, we is it important in your body, for instance, to be able to tell what cells are you and what cells are not you? Yes. Yeah. So having these tags uh, that help to label the cell and let us know what it is, is another important function that these carbohydrates can do. All right, questions on that? I'm gonna need to cheat and move all of this over here. And we have lipids, we have carbohydrates. Do you think we're gonna have proteins in our plasma membrane? Yes. Absolutely. And so there are also a tremendous number of proteins that are associated uh, with our plasma membrane as well. There are basically two main types. Uh, the first of these main types is what we call an integral membrane protein. An integral membrane protein is a protein that is embedded 
in one or oops, or both layers of the plasma membrane. Uh, so for instance, and let's go ahead and use, uh, we'll use blue for these. I could have a protein that goes all the way through the phospholipid barrier. Or I could have a protein that is just embedded, no, I want this to be blue, within one layer. Both of these are integral membrane proteins. They're both embedded within the phospholipid bilayer. So they're both integral. However, the one that goes all the way through is also known as a transmembrane protein. However, there are also peripheral peripheral membrane proteins. These are proteins that can be associated with the phospholipid bilayer. So it could be something like this, even attached to a protein on the surface or even can be on the outer surface as well, but it's not actually embedded within it. So peripheral membrane proteins are associated, but not attached to it. And not surprisingly, function, uh, proteins being the most diverse of the different types, uh, some can also act as tags to help us to be able to identify. Uh, some can allow movement into or out of the cell. So they can be things like channels or things like uh, uh, transporters. And we'll talk about what the difference of those are in a moment. Uh, they could be receptors uh, for like a chemical signal to bind to it, to tell it what's going on, enzymes, and on and on. There are all sorts of different types of functions for this. So notice we've made a bit of a mess of our picture here, but if we think about it and look at the pretty front picture from your textbook, that's exactly what it looks like as well. So again, we talked about those membrane lipids, the phospholipids and cholesterols, or membrane carbohydrates like the glycocalyx or other types of tags, uh, integral and peripheral membrane proteins like pores and, and uh, movers, receptors, enzymes, markers, linkers, all those kind of things. And when you put it together, as we see from the pretty picture in your textbook, it really is a big, huge mess, right? With that simple thing we draw as a simple line on the outside of our cell has a tremendous amount of stuff coming out going on. As we talked about from the very beginning, yes, it is starting with those phospholipids arranged in a bilayer, but like we see there are cholesterols located in here, all sorts of carbohydrates on the outer surface. We have integral membrane proteins that are embedded within the plasma membrane and peripheral membrane proteins that are associated with it, but not actually connected to it. So there's a whole lot of stuff going on. Uh, so you are correct in that our nuclear envelope is also made up of phospholipids arranged in a layer. And in fact, remember it's arranged in a bilayer. And there are indeed proteins that form the nuclear pores so that things can get into and out. 
but it's not going to have the carbohydrates. It's not going to have a lot of these components. So yes, plasma membrane forms the nuclear envelope, but it's a different type of plasma membrane than what's forming our plasma membrane of the cell. So we do have phospholipids arranged in a double bilayer to form the nuclear envelope. But right now we're specifically talking about the outer surface of the cell, the plasma membrane. All right. Questions on that? All right. If we're comfortable with the anatomy, we can start talking about the function. Let's see how much room I have left to write on here. I can kind of sneak this in, especially if we sneak that down there. And we can just go ahead and erase that one. All right. As we kind of hinted at, this plasma membrane is a barrier that is going to limit what is able to get into and outside of the cell. However, is it an imper impermeable barrier where nothing can get in and out? No. No. And in fact, the way we say that is our plasma membrane forms a semi permeable membrane. It's kind of like the screen door on the front of your house, right? Again, maybe not these days with all the smoke outside, but during a nice uh, fall day like today, you might want to have your door open, right? And with that screen door, the sounds of the birds, the smell of your neighbor baking a pie, the wind, those types of things can get inside. But insects, your neighbor's dog, the mailman, can't get into your house because that uh, screen door is closed, all right? So it is semi-permeable. It allows some things through. Well, what kind of things do you think can get through our plasma membrane? What kind of things could possibly just move straight in or out without uh, any help or any assistance, just sneak right on through. Proteins, lipids. Okay, but so proteins though are tend to be big. Do you think big things are gonna be able to easily sneak through? No. No, so probably be the opposite. So something that is small. So small things can sneak through. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Now you happen to mention lipids. Notice what's forming the barrier as we talked about. The barrier is being formed by these nonpolar fatty acid tails. Mm -hmm. And while they don't like water, like likes like. So you're right, something that is lipid based, would that be able to uh, sneak right through? Sure, absolutely. Anything else? Well, viruses aren't, can sneak their way in. We'll talk about how that occurs, but that isn't something that we want normally happening. So we're talking about the normal function of the cell. We won't talk about illnesses and things like that till later, uh, but what, about what else? Ions? I'm sorry? Specific ions. Okay, but remember ions by their name are charged particles. Is something that is charged, something that polar, is it going to be able to get through that non-polar tail region? No. No. But what about the opposite? What about something that is non-polar? Yeah. Yeah, so absolutely. So small things, lipid-based things, non-polar things, those are the things that are going to be able to get through. Again, an enzyme uh, is a big protein. That isn't something that's going to be able to easily get into and out of the cell. So it's got to be something small, something lipid-based, something nonpolar. Is there anything else you can think of that might be able to get through a plasma membrane? Maybe some water? Water is tricky. Let's talk about water. Water. Is it small? No. No? Pretty yeah. sure water is just made up of two hydrogen molecules and one oxygen molecule. Isn't that pretty small? Yes. Yeah, that's pretty darn small. Absolutely. However, 
Is water lipid based? Is water nonpolar? Water is polar and non lipid based. Exactly. So, based on the criteria we came up with, you wouldn't think water would be able to get through the plasma membrane. But of but course, the polar heads do. True, but the polar heads don't pass from one side to the other. No. Right? So, so you wouldn't think that water would be able to get through. But obviously, we're having this discussion because what do you know about water? Is water it's able broken. to? Is water able to get into and out of the cell? Oh, that's hydrogen. Um, yes. Yeah, absolutely, right? Like I said, we know this better than most because here in Sacramento, someone tried to not wee to get a wee, drank a massive amount of water in a very short period of time, would upset the, uh, the osmolarity of their blood, causing water to rush into their cells, causing their cells to die, causing their organs to fail, causing that person to die as a result of it. So yes, even though water shouldn't, it turns out it does. And what's interesting is we don't 100% know how. The best guess that we currently have goes back to this idea of the fluid mosaic. As we talked about, uh, these phospholipids are constantly changing places with each other. And when they're constantly changing places, there's tiny gaps in those spaces. And so they believe water may be able to sneak through those gaps while the phospholipids are changing positions. So they believe that that might be how water sneaks in or sneaks out. <coughs> now, as, uh, as Crystal pointed out, uh, absolutely things like oxygen, things like uh, carbon dioxide, these are things that uh, absolutely are um, small, nonpolar, and so those gases are absolutely able to easily sneak their way in and out. Can sodium? No, the problem with sodium is sodium is a charged ion. So it can't sneak through all by itself. However, do we want to get sodium into the cell? No. Yeah. As it turns out, oh. sodium helps cells do work. So absolutely, there are times oh. when we want sodium to get in. So sodium can't get in by itself, but lucky for us, remember we have proteins like those channels that can allow things like sodium into the cell. So basically anything that isn't anything that isn't small, lipid-based, nonpolar, or isn't water needs help to get in. And that help comes in the form of our channels and our transporters. Let's go back to the pretty picture. So again, something that is small, nonpolar, lipid-based is able to get through. Water can, and that movement just through the plasma membrane without any help is called simple diffusion. Now, the movement of water is somewhat special. So absolutely, mo water moves by simple diffusion. But A, because anatomists hate you and love to name everything. Uh, but B, uh, because water is so important, they give a fancy name to the simple diffusion of water. Anybody know what the fancy name of the simple diffusion of water is? Yeah, there you go. Osmosis. But all osmosis means is simple diffusion of water. So the same rules that affect simple diffusion of other molecules affects the simple diffusion of water as well. Amanda, do you have a question? Um, just, I don't know how this, it's, I was wondering what um, the phospholipid heads are like. Are they smooth or are they, um, do they have any kind of, I guess like, like you know, like there's villi and uh, on other um, parts of the cell, like is this phospholipids just smooth? Well, but remember, um, the microvilli, for instance, are huge extensions of the plasma membrane. So mm -hmm. the bit of plasma membrane that goes around a single microvilli may literally have millions of phospholipids on them. So these are um, tiny, tiny little molecules. Okay. Yeah.
All right. Excellent. Now, <clears throat> this idea of simple diffusion is not a, a new concept. We'll talk about this. Uh, we'll make sense of it. It's something that you're all absolutely familiar with. But as I mentioned, if you're not small, if you're not nonpolar, if you're not lipid or water, so these are the things like you talked about. These are things that are like ions or bigger things like a glucose or even bigger things like proteins. They need help to get inside. Those transmembrane integral proteins Uh, that come in two flavors, channels or transporters. And what do you think the difference between a channel and a transporter is? Any idea? One takes energy. Exactly. A channel does not use energy. And when we're talking about energy in the cell, what are we talking about? What's the energy of the cell? ATP, there we go, excellent does not use ATP. And because of that, we call it passive. Whereas a transporter does use ATP. And so we call that active. So we can use active and passive movement of ions through uh, proteins. Although there was another way that we talked about that you could get things, well, certainly out of the cell and then therefore also can be used to bring things in the cell. What was the other way we talked about being able to get stuff like proteins out of the cell? Vesicles, absolutely. We bundled things up into a vesicle, we brought it to the plasma membrane and we released it. And what did we call that process? Um, trans, um, uh, trans something. <laughs> Close. Mitch has got it. Exocytosis. Oh, exocytosis. Right. Okay. And notice the same thing can happen the opposite way as well. Something can attach to the outside of the plasma membrane. We can wrap the plasma membrane around it and bring it inside. And what would we call that process? Well, if it's exocytosis, when we kick it out, when we bring it in, that would be endocytosis. So notice the other way we can get things, especially really big things in, is by using vesicles. And so this would be endocytosis to bring things in. And exocytosis to kick things out. So the other way we can get things, especially big things or a lot of things in and out is by using vesicles. So anything that's not small, not nonpolar, not lipid and not water, we need to use some kind of protein or use some kind of vesicle to get it in and out. All righty, this is a good place for our first break. Let's go ahead and take our first break here. We'll take a 15 minute break. That means coming back at 926 and at 926, we'll pick up the lecture. Amanda, did you have a new picture, a new question or uh, was oh, that answered? No. Okay, perfect. Restart and I will start the recording at this point. All right, any other questions before we take our first break? All right, I will see you guys in 15 minutes. All righty. So let's go ahead and get started. Any questions before we get rolling? All right, we were talking about this idea of simple diffusion. And again, simple diffusion is not a concept that you are not familiar with. We have, you're all familiar with this because you've all experienced this before because you've all made Kool-Aid, right? You got a big, huge pitcher filled with water. And you take that packet of Kool-Aid and you drop those crystals into there. What happens? 
It dissolves. It dissolves. Okay, absolutely. It is polar, so it dissolves in water. But does it dissolve in water and all stay right here in the corner where you put it? No. No. These molecules have their own energy, inert energy. And what's going to happen is the molecules move randomly. However, while they're moving randomly, since there are a large number of them here in the corner, this dynamic movement of these molecules, they move from a, they move from a high concentration to a low concentration. So more of them are going to be moving away from this environment than are going to be moving towards it. And so the net effect is they move from that high concentration to a low concentration until what happens? They are equally dispersed. Exactly. This is going to continue until the molecules are equally dispersed throughout our picture. And what do we call that point? Equilibrium. There you go, exactly. Until that solution reaches equilibrium. Now, here's an important thing in the definition of equilibrium. Is equilibrium truly going to be like the picture is here where everybody is equal distance from each other? When I imagine this in my mind, I always think back to my uh, daughter's kindergarten class. Whenever we would go into the kindergarten class, our kindergarten teacher had some kind of dance or song or something like that the kids were going to do. And the first thing the kids had to do was they had to stand up because they'd all been sitting tightly together in a cluster. And basically, she would have all the kids swing their arms and everybody would move away from each other until when they swung their arms, they didn't hit anybody else. And so once they did that, everybody was kind of evenly distributed in their room. And is that what happens? That molecules of Kool-Aid is spreading its arms till it finds its perfect spot and it stays there forever? No. No. These molecules are still going to continue to move. However, now for every molecule that moves to the right, one is gonna to move to the left. For every molecule that moves up, one is gonna move down. So equilibrium is not a point where the movement stops. Equilibrium is the point where there is no net change. That is what equilibrium is. Equilibrium is this point where there's no net change. And again, you know this. If you stood there and stared at a pitcher of Kool-Aid from now till the end of time, would there ever be a period of time where suddenly a clear spot would open up inside the Kool-Aid where there were no crystals inside of that and you would see the clear water again? No. No, of course not. Once it reaches that point of equilibrium, that point of no net change, it's going to stay there forever. And notice this is a passive process. What does that mean again? <laughs> goes through the channel so it's not charged notice we're not even talking about channels right now we're not even talking about plasma membranes we're just talking about pictures oh, of it's not charged not no, no energy. energy no energy exactly no atp is used in this process All right so i pour that uh that that packet of kool-aid into the pitcher and let it start to mix and let it start to move and reach equilibrium now my kids usually aren't patient enough for that. So after they pour the packet of Kool-Aid in there, what do they do? Swirl it around. Mix it. Yeah, you put a spoon in there and you mix and you stir it around. Notice if you're doing that, you're adding energy to it. It's no longer a passive process. But if you actually left it alone, it would reach equilibrium on its own. So we don't have to add energy. 
adding energy makes it mix faster, makes it reach equilibrium faster, but it's not required. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't things that can affect the rate of diffusion. What kind of things can make a diffusion go faster or slower? A catalyst. Okay, catalysts though involve chemical reactions. Remember, there's no chemical reaction taking place. Oh, okay. And remember, yes, adding energy by doing that would affect it as well, but we're just talking, excellent, temperature. Temp is a great example. Remember, temperature okay. basically affects the uh, speed of the molecular movement. So if temperature goes up, what happens to our rate of diffusion? Speeds up. It speeds up as well, excellent. What's another thing that can affect the rate of diffusion? Size? Size of the molecule. Or we could also say the mass of the molecule. What's going to reach equilibrium first, a large molecule or a small molecule? Small. Small, absolutely. So the smaller the molecule, the faster it's going to reach uh, equilibrium. What else? the space of the area, right? Okay, the distance it has to travel, I like that. Think about this, if you had two pitchers, one that was very tall and very narrow, and one that was short and squat, and both of them contained one liter of water, and you put the exact same number of crystals inside of them, would they both reach equilibrium at the same period of time? No. no, it turns out the answer is no. And the reason for that is the distance it has to travel. Notice in this short squat box, the molecules don't have to move as far. Whereas in this tall, narrow one, they have to go much, much further to reach the end. So the distance they have to travel means that they will have to produce, um, uh, uh, I mean, the, the farther they have to travel, the slower the rate of diffusion will be. So the distance it has to travel, absolutely. Uh, another way to think of this, and let's do it this way. I'm gonna draw two more uh, boxes filled with water. Is that the same thing as the concentration gradient? No, and that's excellent. I'm so glad that you said that because that's exactly where I was going next. What do you mean by that? Uh, the difference in the concentrations between the two um, liquids Perfect. Or, or substances. Absolutely. Here's what I'm going to do. I've got these two beakers filled with water, and I'm going to make this a little bit more sophisticated. I'm going to put a membrane along the center, separating the two sides of the pitcher. And as you mentioned, on this side, I'm gonna put 75% Kool-Aid. And on this one, I'm gonna put 50% Kool-Aid. Then I'm gonna take a screwdriver. And with that screwdriver, I'm gonna poke five holes in that membrane. Is the Kool-Aid going to move equally in both of these? Or will it move faster in, we'll make this one A, and we'll make this one B? Which will it move faster in? Will it move faster in A, or will it move faster in B? A. 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 Got a couple people say A. Anybody believe B? The same. The same. Excellent. Exactly. I like that. That's a good answer. Or for those of you who didn't answer, is it because you didn't know or because you knew I hadn't given you enough information? What if I then told you on this side, there is already 70% Kool-Aid and over here on this side, there is 10% Kool-Aid. Now, which one's gonna be faster, A or B? B. B. Notice when we talk about concentration gradient, we're not talking about the absolute amount, we're talking about the differences between the two locations.
Notice the difference here is much, much bigger. So it's gonna go much faster here. And as we mentioned, it will continue to go until it reaches equilibrium. And just out of curiosity, what would equilibrium be for this bottom pitcher for pitcher B? 30, 30. Yeah, 30% on this side and 30% on this side. Remember at that point, it isn't that there's no more movement. At this point, there is no net change. So basically for everyone that went to the left, there'd be one that went to the right and it would be at equilibrium. So excellent, concentration grading is definitely a big example. And let's talk about one more simple example. Uh, what's the easiest way for me to do this? I guess I'll just erase all the middle stuff in this. Yes, Angie. Um, I'm trying to follow along in our textbook. Where are we with equilibrium? Where are, where are we in the textbook with this? Uh, we're, well, we're talking about the plasma membrane and the transport. So uh, we're still kind of talking about the Kool-Aid uh, in the picture. So we'll, uh, I don't know where exactly that is in the textbook, but I know it's in this chapter. Uh, we're talking about the plasma membrane. We're getting to plasma membrane transport. So that's kind of what we're working towards. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay. All right, so let's set these both up the same. 50% on both of these here, 10% on both of these here. And again, I have that membrane in between. However, this time with my screwdriver in the top one, I poke five holes. And in the bottom one, I only poke one hole. Am I gonna get equal movement there as well? No. 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 Uh, great question. I saw, sorry, I missed that question before. It wasn't that B reached equilibrium faster because it had less Kool-Aid. It moved faster because there was a greater difference between the two environments. One of the ways to think of this, as we've talked about, here's kind of the key concept. Things move from a high concentration to a low concentration. If I'm standing at a top of a hill and I have a ball and I let the ball go, what does that ball do? It drops. Yeah, it rolls to the bottom of the hill. Do I need to push it or kick it or use any of my energy to get it to roll down the hill? No. No. It has its own kinetic energy or own potential energy that it uses to roll down the hill. And the steeper the hill, the faster the ball goes. So the greater the concentration gradient, the faster diffusion takes place. All right, so hopefully that answers that question. And then now, as I was mentioning here, which of these two is gonna go faster, A or B? A. A, because there are more holes for it to pass through. Uh, the fancy term we give for that is basically surface area. The more space there is for change to take place, the faster that change will occur. So the more holes I poke, the faster it'll go. All right, let's go back to the lecture and see if I hit all of the concepts that I wanted to. So notice the concentration gradient, temperature, size, distance, surface area, excellent. We've hit all of them. So all of those things affect how fast diffusion occurs. And as we kind of just hinted at, a channel is basically just a hole in the plasma membrane. Kind of like your door frame in your house. You have a door frame in your house and does that door frame determine what direction you go into or out of that house? No, what determines it is your motivation. Right, so there's no directionality to that door frame. Now, that doesn't mean it can't be selective. Notice you can get into your house through that door, but an elephant or your car can't get into the house through that door. And the door frame, and your door frame has a door, which sometimes can be locked and sometimes can be unlocked. So even though this is passive, 
and has no directionality to it. Uh, it can still be selective and it can still be locked or unlocked. And so the term we use for that is gated. So notice here, this door, this channel in our plasma membrane looks like we have equal amount of stuff on the left and the right. So basically we're gonna have, wow, that's way too big. We're gonna have equal movement of things in and out. However, as we talked about, molecules like to move down their concentration gradient, like balls like to roll down hills. So notice here, there's more stuff on the left, less stuff on the right. So our molecules will passively move through that channel from the left to the right. Of course, if we flip that around and put a bunch of stuff on this side, well, then what would happen is it would move the opposite direction. It's always going to go down the hill. And we don't need energy for that. But what if we did want it to move this way? Could we get a molecule to move this way if we wanted to? Yes. Yeah, but is it going to want to do it on its own? No. No. So notice, just like that ball, the ball will roll down its hill on its own. But if I want to get that ball to the top of the hill, I need to use energy. And the same thing is true for our molecules. If we want molecules to move against their concentration gradient, we have to use energy. And that would require a transporter. Exactly. And that's going to require a special protein. And that special protein will be some type of transporter. Exactly. Exactly. All right, let's talk about these, see if we can make some sense of this. Angie, do you have a question or was that, is that hand still up from before? That's from before. Okay, I'll close, I'll lower it, thanks. Didn't wanna be ignoring you. All right. So as we just finished talking about, uh, let's, do that's what I want. Here's our cell again. Now, as we have already talked about in this class, we know that there is an unequal distribution of ions inside and outside of the cell. Give me an example of an ion we have talked about in this class that is unequally distributed inside and outside of the cell? Sodium. Excellent. And where was there more sodium, inside the cell or outside the cell? Outside. Outside, excellent. I noticed someone wrote chloride. Where is there more chloride, inside the cell or outside the cell? Outside. Outside, excellent. Give me another one. Potassium. Potassium, where is there more potassium, inside or outside? Inside. Excellent. And, and one more. Nitrogen? Calcium? Yeah, calcium. calcium, the one that makes cells do wonky things. And where is there more of that calcium? Outside. Uh, outside. Excellent. So we know there's this unequal distribution of ions inside and outside. That should have a second positive on it as well. Excellent. And so as we know, as we just finished learning, things want to move down their concentration gradient. We call this desire to want to move down their concentration gradient. We refer to this as their chemical force. So let's think about this. For sodium, what is the direction of its chemical force? Does it want to go into the cell or outside of the cell? Outside. 
It wants to go down its concentration gradient from a high concentration to a low concentration. Oh. So it's so gonna wanna move in or out? Inside. Inside, absolutely. So it's chemical force. is wanting it to move in. And which way is the chemical force of chloride? Inside. Excellent. And which way is the chemical force of calcium? Inside. Inside. Excellent. And which way is the chemical force of potassium? Outside. Excellent. Perfect. So far, so good. That all hopefully makes sense. Things might move from a high concentration to a low concentration. But there's another concept that I'm not 100% sure we've talked about yet. Not only is there an unequal distribution of ions and that causes this chemical force, but this unequal uh, distribution of ions gives the cell, because remember, these are all charged particles, a uh, charge. So basically, there's an unequal distribution of positive and negative things. And it turns out uh, there is more, let's do that. It turns out the inside of the cell is more negative than the outside. And so when the cell is at rest, and again, Rest does not mean that it's not doing anything. Rest means that it's at equilibrium. And remember equilibrium means there is no net change. And at rest, it has a resting membrane potential of negative 70 millivolts. So the inside of the cell is more negative and the outside of the cell is more positive. And again, if you leave the cell alone, that cell will happily sit at its resting membrane potential of negative 70 millivolts forever. It will be happy. However, ions are like three-year-olds. Any of you who have ever known a three-year-old, what does a three-year-old care about? Come on, some of you must have met a three-year-old before. There you go, milk true, but I think Crystal's got it on, the, uh, hit it on the head. All a three-year-old cares about is themselves, right? They'll cut you, they'll cut the cat, they'll cut the mailman, anybody to get what they want. All they do is care about themselves. So sodium doesn't care about the cell. Potassium doesn't care about the cell. They just care about themselves. And notice all of these things, sodium, potassium, chloride, and calcium are all ions. They're all charged particles. And charged particles, something that's positive, does it like something that's positive? Do two positive things like each other? No. No, right? They repulse each other. Whereas a positive and a negative, do they like each other? Yes. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So that effect of the charge, this is going to be way too big. The charge of the ion and the charge of the cell is what we call the electrical force. So the electrical force also affects an ion. I need to make that smaller so it fits. 
So let's think about this. The electrical force for sodium, which way is it going to be? Uh, being a positive ion, does it want to go inside where it's negative or does it want to stay outside where it's positive? Inside. Inside. Notice both the chemical force and the electrical force of sodium wants in the cell. Sodium really, really, really wants to get inside of a cell. And so we can actually get that sodium to do work for us. Kind of like me with that ball at the top of the hill. If I'm standing way at the top of a very steep hill and you're way down at the bottom and I need to tell you something, I could use all my energy to yell it at the top of my lungs so that you could hear it. Or I could write it on a piece of paper and tape it to the ball. And then I let the ball go. And when I let the ball go, it rolls down to hill, the hill to you and gives you the message. And I didn't have to use any energy. So a lot of the work that the cell is going to do, we're going to do by letting sodium come in. Sodium really wanting to come in into the cell helps us to do work. Notice the same thing is true for calcium. What's the electrical force of calcium? Inside. Inside, absolutely, because it's another charged particle and wants to go in. However, as we talked about, calcium makes cells do wonky things. And do we want cells doing wonky things all the time? No. No. So we need to be much more careful about our letting of calcium in the cell because calcium makes cells do wonky things. But notice potassium and chloride. Their driving forces aren't that strong. The chemical force for potassium is out, but what way is the electrical force Inside. for potassium? Yeah, being a positive ion, it wants to move in. So how does this work? If we open up a potassium channel, does potassium not move because the chemical force is one direction and the electrical force is the other? Do you think that's what happens? No. No. That would only happen if the two forces are equal. It turns out the two forces aren't equal. Anybody know which force is bigger? Or ask the question this way. If you open a potassium channel, which way does potassium move? Into the cell or out of the cells? Anybody know? I can go inside. Inside. It actually goes outside. So it huh. turns out the chemical force is the stronger force. Hmm. So the chemical force is the stronger force. So when you open a potassium channel, potassium goes out. Notice the same thing is true for chloride. Its chemical force is in, but being negative, it's electrical force is going to be out. And as it turns out, just like potassium, it is the chemical, oops, that's not bigger. It is the chemical force that is bigger. So when you open up a chloride channel, chloride comes in. When you open up a potassium channel, potassium goes out, but notice not as strong because of those differences in forces. So the take home message of all of this is that there are two gradients that affect the movement of ions, both an electrical force and a chemical force. Let's go ahead and get rid of this and look at this. Again, unequal distribution of ions gives us a chemical gradient. More negative stuff on the inside than outside gives us an electrical gradient, what we call the membrane potential. And what did we say the resting membrane potential of the cell was? Negative 70 MB. Yeah, negative 70 millivolts. There aren't going to be a ton of numbers you're going to have to memorize in this class, but I guarantee you this is going to be one of them. We're going to use this a lot. It's negative 70 millivolts. So absolutely. So, and again, so all ions are affected by two forces, an electrical force and a chemical force. All righty. Uh, let's go to...
our whiteboard for this. Osmosis, as I mentioned, is really just a fancy word that means the simple diffusion of water. Let's set up our beaker again. It has the water inside of it. And again, we're going to draw a membrane down the center. And again, on this side, we're going to put our Kool-Aid, although we'll just put glucose. 80% glucose. Oops, oops, I spelled glucose correctly. I have a question. I have an answer. <laughs> um, is the membrane always in the center? Uh, we are setting this up artificially. Normally, basically what we're doing is we're setting up a fake cell. Okay. So we're basically saying like, this is the inside of the cell and this is the outside of the cell. So when we're using a, um, the beaker like this, we're basically just setting up a fake cell. So that when, because cells have stuff on the inside, stuff on the outside and things move across that plasma membrane. So this is just an artificial cell we're basically making. Okay. So excellent. So 80% glucose on this side. And let's go ahead and say, I don't know, 40% glucose on this side. As we talked about, if I were to take my screwdriver and poke a bunch of holes in this, Glucose would move. And which way would glucose move? Both ways. In, inside. True. Oh, and in this case, inside means to the right, correct? So it would move to the right. And it would keep moving to the right until what happened? Equilibrium. Equilibrium. And what would equilibrium actually be in this case? 60%. Excellent. 60% glucose on this side, 60% glucose on this side. And again, as we talked about, oops, yeah, keep doing that. at that point, would glucose stop moving? No. No, it would just be, again, there would be equal movement in both directions. So there would be no net change. Excellent. Makes perfect sense. And again, no new information here. We're just reiterating what we talked about before. But our goal now is to talk about water. And after all, if this side over here is 80% glucose, what's the other 20%? Water? Yeah, exactly. So notice over here, we're 20% water. And what about on the other side? 60%. There you go. There you go. Now, osmosis, if you've taken like an intro biology class, one of the things that they always talk about with osmosis is osmosis is the drawing power on water, right? Water follows stuff. Or they say water follows salt. So if we were to have learned that rule in like a biology 300 or 400 class and we wanted to use that, based on that, which side has more stuff on it? The left or the right? The left. Left. So if instead of taking a screwdriver and poking holes in our membrane, what if we put a special, excuse me, a special protein in the plasma membrane 
that was too small to let glucose go through it, but did let water go through it. If we were allowed to let water flow, which way would water go? To the left. Yeah, because like we just talked about, water goes where there is more stuff. And there's 80% stuff over here, so it's going to go this way. But I don't like special rules. Osmosis is diffusion of water. And I already learned the rule about diffusion. Diffusion is things move from a high concentration to a low concentration. And notice we have our two concentrations. So based on the difference in the concentration gradient, which way is water going to move? Left or right? Left. Yeah. Notice it's going to move to the left. So whether you like the rule water follows salt or whether you just want to have one rule for diffusion, things move from a high concentration to a low concentration, water will move to the left from the right. I have a question. Wait, I'm not done. And then I'll answer your okay. question. Is it going to move until there's an equal amount of water on both sides? No. No, it's going to move until the concentrations are equal. And what would that point be where the concentrations were equal on both sides? How much water would we have on both sides? 40. Excellent. 40% water on this side and 40% water on this side. Now ask your question. I don't know if I'm about to where this makes sense, but let's say it's swapped and there's 20% water on the right side and 60% on the left side. Would water still move to the left or would it go to the no, right? It would go down its concentration gradient. Because remember, if we flip this around, then that would also mean we'd have to flip around the glucose as well. Right, okay. Yeah. Now, we can actually do these types of experiments. Back in ancient times, and by ancient times, I mean when I was in graduate school, this is what we meant by YouTube. A YouTube was actually a U-shaped glass tube that had a special membrane in it. A membrane that had holes that were too small for our sugar molecules to get through, but were big enough for water to get through. So notice you put a higher concentration of sugar on one side, a smaller concentration of sugar on the other side, or we could think about how this side has more water and this side has less water. And based on that, which way is water gonna move? To the left or to the right here in my YouTube? To the right. Exactly. And it is going to move to the right until the concentrations are equal on both sides. Notice the volumes are not equal, but the concentrations are equal. Now, this is the picture from your textbook, and I like this. This one's not from your textbook, but I like this one a little bit more because it also shows us the water molecules as well as the glucose molecules. So it reminds us that our water molecules are smaller than the glucose molecules, that we have more water here on the left, less water on the right, more glucose on the right, less on the left. And again, water moves until there's an equal concentration on both sides. Not equal volume, but equal concentration on both sides. All right, questions on that? Again, if this doesn't make sense, say something now, because we're going to add a little bit to it. All right, if this makes sense, I have a question for you. Is there any way to get the water to go back to the left side? Is there anything I could do to this YouTube to get water to go back to the left side? Well, I'm asking the question, so what should the obvious answer be? Yes. Excellent. 
So what could we do to get water, do you think, to go back to the opposite side? Add more glucose? Sure, absolutely. If we added glucose to this side, that would do it. What if I didn't have any more glucose? Temperature? Would temperature help do that? Temperature wouldn't change the concentration gradient. It might make the water move faster, okay. but it wouldn't make it go back. Okay. Like a force? Exactly, a force. Notice if I put a weight on the left side, then I could force some of that water to go back. And what do we call it when we put that force on the water? We call it a hydrostatic force or a hydrostatic pressure. So when we talk about the functions of the cells, we talk about osmotic pressures and hydrostatic pressures. And that's basically the pressure that water pushes on its environment. I guess the big question is why do we care about all of this? Why am I wasting our time telling us all of these things? Well, again, it's still a little bit of summer left. They've still got some nice warm temperatures. So if like it was a couple of days ago when it's hundred degrees outside, if you decide to go up and tar your roof and you're out in hundred degree temperature moving around that 200 degree tar on your roof and you didn't bother bringing a water bottle up there and you're up there for six hours, you might get dehydrated and they may have to rush you to the hospital. And when they rush you to the hospital, do they just take a big, huge bag of deionized water and put that right into your body? No. No, right? Because our body is filled with water and stuff. That amount of water and stuff is what we call our tonicity. Right. If we go back to our whiteboard, we can talk about this concept of tonicity. We have a beaker. And in this beaker, we put a cell. Now, as we know, cells have water and stuff. inside of them. That stuff is ions, that stuff is organelles, proteins, uh, ATP, all sorts of stuff. And it has some percentage of stuff. Now, if like we just finished talking about, I filled this beaker with that deionized water we were just talking about, what percentage of water is deionized water? Okay, I'll ask a question this uh, way. How much stuff is in deionized water? There shouldn't be anything. There shouldn't be anything. So it should be 100% water and 0% stuff, right? That makes sense? Yeah. Excellent. So if I put that cell inside of that deionized water, notice outside here is all water and there's no stuff. Is this cell going to be at equilibrium? No. No. Which way is water going to move? Well, it's water goes gonna yeah, move. into the cell. Water goes to where there's more stuff. There's more stuff inside the cell. Water moves down its concentration gradient. Whatever's inside the cell has to be less than 100. So water is going to go into the cell. And our cell is going to swell up. And much like a water balloon, if you put too much water inside of it, what happens? Pops? Yeah, it can burst, absolutely. Uh, we call that that the cell is going to lice as a result of it. And so when you, they bring you in after you being out there on the roof, getting all dehydrated, we don't want to destroy your cells, right? This type of an environment, this type of solution is what we call a hypotonic 
solution, oops, all one word, where there is less stuff in the solution than in the cell. And that causes the cell to swell up and to burst. Instead, when you get rushed to the hospital, what do they put in your arm instead? Saline. Yeah, some type of saline or lactated ringer or something like that. Again, we have water and stuff inside of the cell. And we use that lactated ringer or that saline solution that has the same amount of water and stuff in it. And so when we use that lactated ringer, now is there gonna be equal movement into and out of the cell? Yes. Yeah. And so at this point, it's at equilibrium and we would call this an isotonic solution. Right, where we have the same amount of water and stuff as the cell. And our cell is happy at equilibrium. All right, with me so far? Excellent. So yes. since it's 100 degrees outside, rather than tarring the roof, you decide to go ocean fishing. And when you're out ocean fishing, your boat top sizes. And as it capsizes, you are dumped into the Pacific Ocean, surrounded by water. And since you're surrounded by that salt water of the ocean, it's perfectly acceptable to go ahead and drink that. Now, granted, fish poop in it, so you do have to worry about that. But other than the fish poop, it's totally acceptable to drink that salt water of the ocean. Yes? No. Never no, drink salt water. <laughs> what, don't drink salt water. Exactly. Why not? Because it'll dehydrate you. Exactly. The reason is that salt water of the ocean actually has more stuff in it than your cells. What kind of solution do you think we call this? Hypertonic. Hypertonic. There you go. Exactly. And so as you mentioned, as a result of that, uh, water is going to be drawn out. Oops, I wanted that to be red. It's going to be drawn out of the cell, causing it to dehydrate. That's one of the big problems that occurs with these people who are in their boats that capsize. Yes, you have to worry about being eaten by the shark, but if you're sitting there immersed in the water for three days, holding on to a board from your boat that sank, your body is surrounded by that salt water and it's constantly pulling water out of you, causing your cells to dehydrate. Now, they will do this where you see this often in like a, um, in an uh, experimental setting is they'll take blood out of your body and drop put the drops of blood in here. And when a red blood cell has the water pulled out of it, it shrinks and crumples up in a process they call crenation. And so that crenation can occur, uh, that shriveling up of the cell as the water goes up, the cell decreases in size and shrivels up. So we've done that here with our pretty pictures of the drawing. Let's take a look at this here. Again, ideally we want our cells in an isotonic solution where the amount of water is equal, the amount of stuff is equal outside and inside, and it'll happily sit at equilibrium. A hypertonic solution is where there's too much stuff outside, so water is drawn out and we get the crumpling up of the cell, that crenation. And like that uh, deionized water, 
we have our hypotonic solution where water rushes in, causing that red blood cell to fill up like a balloon. And if it fills up too much, it pops. All right. So that's why this osmolarity matters because we care about the tonicity of our cells. We have to maintain a healthy environment, right? So don't, not we to win a we. Questions on this? All right, the last big concept we have to talk about for lecture is our membrane transport. As we've talked about, membrane transport comes in two flavors, passive and active. What does passive mean? No charge. Not no, no energy, charge. no ATP. ATP. No, no ATP, ATP is used, excellent. No ATP is used, whereas active means that ATP is used. Excellent in that process. So let's talk about these active and passive processes, but I want to go ahead. This is, I think, probably the densest material we have to cover today, and we're still doing good on time. So I want to go ahead and take our last break here. We'll still have time to finish this and then also do our practice exam. So let's take one last break, take a 15 minute break, come back at 1033, and at 1033, we will restart. All right. Questions on that? All right, I will see you in 15 minutes.
All righty. No. Apparently, I didn't pause the recording. So uh, when you get to watch this, you get to sit for 15 minutes and stare at the screen or fast forward. All righty. Any questions before we get rolling? All right. We need to talk about membrane transport, passive and active. And we're going to start with our passive transport methods. As we mentioned, uh, with passive, this does not use ATP. So instead, we have to use the driving force of the molecule. So as we know, with passive uh, transport, uh, things move down their concentration gradient. And those things can be the solutes, right? Which would just be simple diffusion or even the solvent, the water, which as we mentioned is osmosis. Now I'm going to cheat and move to our whiteboard. I'll go ahead and clear that. I'm gonna give us a plasma membrane down here. And then I'm gonna, We'll start with the line here, although I'm guessing I'm going to be able to move that. Over here, we are going to talk about passive membrane transport. As I just finished mentioning, does not use ATP and it moves down the concentration gradient. Now, the most basic part, um, pardon me, the most basic type of passive membrane transport is simple diffusion. Someone remind me again what that means? For the... Um... And more you used it for when the phospholipids barely shift and the water kind of peaks through. Excellent. And what else besides water was able to move via simple diffusion? Um, ions. Yeah. Uh, was it ions? Oh. The opposite. Proteins? Nonpolar things. Non -polar. Yes. Small things and lipid based things. Right? Oops. Those things were able to move via simple diffusion. And basically, remember, simple diffusion just merely means that it passes through the plasma membrane without any help. That was simple diffusion. But you also hit it on the head. Remember, as we mentioned, osmosis is also basically just the simple diffusion of water where it's able to sneak through the cracks. And so again, that osmosis is also an example of simple diffusion. Anything else, as we've talked about, needs help to get through. So anything that needs help getting through, we call facilitated. Diffusion. Facilitated diffusion is basically where we need the help of a protein to get through the plasma membrane. Actually, let's do it this way. Maybe facilitate diffusion big, and then a little bit smaller beneath that. So facilitated diffusion only happens during active transport? No. no. Excellent question. We need a protein to get through the plasma membrane, but remember this is still a passive process, which means no ATP 
and it's going to be down the concentration gradient. So remember, we talked about the example where I could put a couple proteins into the plasma membrane of our cell. And they would form what we call a channel, like your door frame. A channel is basically formed by proteins. And then the hole is what we call the pore. So the proteins make a structure that call a channel. And whoops, that's not how you spell hole. And then the hole that something passes through would be the pore. So this here would be the pore. That a molecule is able to move through. So if for instance, this was a sodium channel, which way would sodium move? Into the cell or out of the cell? Into the cell. If instead this was a potassium channel, which way would potassium move? Out of the cell. Out of the cell, excellent. Right, so again, the channel, the proteins, things move down their concentration gradient. We're not using ATP. But notice, as I mentioned, these channels can still be selective. You can have a channel that is just for sodium or just for potassium or just for calcium, and they can be gated, meaning that they're able to open and close. Like I said, like the door frame of your front of your house. You can get inside of your house, but an elephant or uh, an RV are not getting in that door frame. And you have a door in that door frame that can be locked. So you can get in now, but when your kids are bad, you can lock them outside so they can't get inside. So just because it's passive doesn't mean it can't be selective, doesn't mean it can't be gated. It just doesn't change, it doesn't move, it's just a hole. That hole is the pore formed by the proteins that are the channel. Are we comfortable with that? Just gets worse from here. So if this doesn't make sense, let me know now because it's just gonna get worse. All right. How many of you have been to the Sacramento Zoo before? Yes. Excellent, at least one person, hopefully more of you. It's a great little zoo. So you get to go inside, you spend the day there, you have a tremendous, amazing time, and then it's time to leave. How do you get out of the zoo? You Anyone exit? remember? Maybe a gate, a, yeah, exit. Is it just a gate though? Anybody no, it's remember? like a bunch of bars. It's basically a roll, and, and what happens with those bars? It, they roll they around. Turn. Yeah, they turn. They kind of yeah. like cattle you out. <laughs> exactly. Excellent. Corral. Yeah. For that gate, that revolving bar gate, does the zoo have it plugged into an outlet where they're using their electricity to allow that gate to be constantly spinning and you just no. have to walk out? No, it uses your force. No, you have to grab the bar, you have to push the bar, you rotate the bar so that you can get out. Cells have the exact same type of thing. In a cell, we call this a carrier. A carrier is a protein that changes shape to move a molecule in or out of the cell, but it uses the energy of the molecule. So it is still passive. It's still not using ATP. 
A great example of this is a glucose carrier. Glucose is a really big molecule. So if you think about it, if you put a channel in the cell for glucose to be able to get into or out of the cell, right? If you put a hole in the side of your house so that an elephant could get in and out, is an elephant gonna be the only thing that gets in and out of that hole? No. No, lots of other stuff are gonna get in and out as well. And then you've lost your selective permeability. Then things are just moving willy nilly. We don't want that. So if we want to get something big in, what we can do is use something like a carrier. For a carrier, carriers typically, again, like all these things are made up of proteins, but typically what happens is the protein is just open on one side. So let's do a little drawing here. I can get rid of that. And get rid of that, and get rid of that. Oh, and I need to get rid of one more thing. So it's this proteins or series of proteins and it has a binding site on it. So what happens is a glucose molecule comes in and when that glucose molecule binds with the protein, it causes the protein to change its shape. And now suddenly what's gonna to happen to this protein is that it is going to be open now on the inside. And so this is an active transport? No, this is not active transport. The same way that you push on the door of that revolving door on the zoo so that you can get out. The zoo is using your energy to get you out of the cell. The zoo is not using any energy to get you out of the cell, right? You are changing the shape of that door to get out. And so the energy of that glucose binding to it causes it to change its shape. And so now it changes its shape. Now it's open on the inside. And now that it's open on the inside, whoops, don't wanna do that. That glucose can now let go. And guess what? When the glucose lets go, it's now into the cell. And guess what happens to this carrier? It moves back. Yeah, it goes back to its original shape. So it changes shape, but it's using the energy of the glucose. It's not using ATP. It's using the energy of the glucose to change the shape. Just like you push on that revolving door to get out of the zoo, glucose is using its energy to get into the cell. Again, I appreciate that these drawings are a little simplistic, so let's look at the pretty pictures from your textbook. Again, with passive transport, we have simple diffusion and facilitated diffusion. Simple diffusion, remember, is just passing through the plasma membrane without any help. Whereas facilitated diffusion, facilitate means to help, uses proteins. And when we're using proteins, there are basically two types of protein structures, channels and carriers. Here is an example of a channel. And here's a great example, a better drawing than the one I have here. Notice we have the channel formed by this protein forming a circular donut shape in our plasma membrane. And it has a hole, a pore through the middle of it. This one happens to be specific for potassium. So notice our potassium is able to leave. However, notice also that this channel happens to have two additional special proteins. One is a long linear protein and one is a big globular protein. They actually have very technical names for this. 
they refer to as the ball and chain. And notice the ball of that ball and chain can wedge itself into the pore. And notice when it's in the pore, now our gate is closed and potassium can't leave anymore. So just because they're holes doesn't mean they can't be fancy. They can be specific, they can be gated, and they're typically gonna allow small things like sodium and potassium move. And again, these things are moving down their concentration gradient. And so uh, again, this is passive, not using any ATP. All right, questions on our channel. All right, let's take a better look at our carrier. Notice again, here's our plasma membrane. Here are our proteins forming our carrier, which again is passive, does not use ATP. But notice, unlike the channel, it is only open on one side and closed on the other. Now, when a molecule like our glucose, a bigular molecule comes in and binds, we use the energy of that molecule to change its shape. Now, as we know, anatomists love to name everything. And so when a molecule changes its shape, they have a fancy term for it. It undergoes a conformational change, which again, sounds super impressive. You can call grandma up after class today and say, hey, guess what, grandma? When a glucose binds to a carrier, it undergoes a conformational change. And she'll be very impressed and she'll send you 20 bucks in the mail. But remember, all that means is that it changes the shape of the uh, protein. But again, it does it without ATP. That is why this is passive because it's not using ATP. It is using the energy of the glucose. And when that occurs, then as you can see, it opens up after that conformational change on the other side and the glucose can come in. Once the glucose comes in, it goes back to its original shape and a new glucose binds, it changes shape and brings the glucose in. And it goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, bringing glucose in without ever using ATP. Yes, Aubrey. Yeah, I had a question. If it is, um, if it does use ATP, is it still considered conformational change? Yes, when we use ATP to change the shape of a molecule, that is also considered a conformational change. Yep. Okay, thank you. Yep. Yeah, again, undergoing a conformational change just means that it changes shape. Just a fancy way of saying that. Great question, any others? All right, perfect. That is our passive transport mechanism. So now let's talk about active. And I'm gonna cheat and come back to the whiteboard for this. So we are talking about active membrane transport. And let's think in terms of some definitions. Are we ever going to have a simple active transport where things just move through the plasma membrane without any help at all? No. No, that doesn't make any sense. So this is going to always use proteins. So notice all active transport is facilitated because it all uses proteins. And remember, with our active transport, we are going to either directly use ATP or indirectly use ATP. Notice we changed our definition there slightly. We'll explain what we mean by that in just a minute, but I wanted to get this part of our definition. And if you think about it, if we're gonna use ATP, 
what direction are we typically going to want to move something? Inside. Well, not necessarily inside, although that's a great guess. We definitely want to use energy to get things inside. But like I said, sodium really wants to come inside. So do I really need to use ATP to do that? No, there you go. Mitch yes. has got it. We're going to typically want to move uh, substances against their concentration gradient. All right. Now, as it turns out, there are two types of active membrane transport. The first type is primary active transport. With primary active transport, we are directly using ATP to move the substance. These primary active transporters are commonly referred to as pumps. So for example, we could have a special protein in the plasma membrane that is a calcium pump. A calcium pump is going to directly use the energy from an ATP. So let's go ahead and bind the ATP to it right here. And if we're using ATP to move calcium, which way do you think we're moving it? Into the cell or out of the cell? Out of the cell? Out of the cell, exactly. So we're going to use that to kick that, a that calcium out of the cell. All right, so far so good. And there are plenty of pumps calcium, sodium, potassium, chloride, all of these. However, probably the most common pump is a pump that is known as the sodium potassium ATPase, because after all, it's an enzyme that uses ATP, or is also known as the sodium potassium ATP pump. When a cell is at rest, close to 25% of its ATP is being used solely in the function of this pump. Now, based on its name, oops, based on its name, guess what the sodium potassium ATPase moves? Sodium and potassium. Sodium and potassium. How much uh, which direction, I'm sorry, I should say, which direction do you think it's going to move sodium? Outside. Inside. Outside, right? Because remember, it wants to come in. So if we're going to use ATP, it's going to move sodium out. And which way do you think it's going to move potassium? Inside. So it uses the energy from a single ATP. Let's go ahead and put an ATP on here. I'm not going to bother writing ATP again, but I'll put it there as a reminder to move sodium and potassium. And it turns out it doesn't just move one potassium in, it actually moves two potassium in. And it turns out it doesn't just move one sodium in, it actually moves three sodium out. Maybe if I put this down here, I can put that there. Perfect. 
So one ATP spins this wheel. And as it spins this wheel, it kicks three sodium out and brings two potassium in. Notice one other thing about this as well. Notice every time we use an ATP, we bring two positive things into the cell, but how many positive things do we kick out? Three. Three. And remember, one of the things we said is the inside of the cell is more negative than the outside. This is one of the things that helps to maintain that, helps to keep the cell at its resting membrane potential. And someone remind me what that resting membrane potential was again? Negative 70. Uh, negative 70. Yeah, negative 70 millivolts. Um, M M yeah. MV is, yeah, millivolts, exactly. Excellent. So there you go. This is our pumps. This is our primary active transport, where we are directly using ATP with these pumps to move things essentially where they don't want to go. All right, questions on that? All right, that brings us to our second type of active membrane transport. And being the clever, sophisticated students that we are, if the first way is primary active transport, guess what the second way is? Secondary. Secondary. Excellent, secondary active transporters. Secondary active transporters get their name because they do not directly use ATP to move substances. But they need ATP to be used elsewhere to keep doing work. So they are going to indirectly use ATP. Now, remember our primary active transporters we called pumps. Our secondary active transporters are called co-transporters. Why do you think they're called co-transporters? Because they're not trying to directly move substances. So they're just- sure. and, and, and when I say co, what does that usually refer to? How, what, is, what are they usually talking about? More than one. More than one. Yeah, more happen. than one, exactly. Basically what these co-transporters do is they use the energy or the driving force, let's say it that way, of one molecule to do the work to move a second. Remember I talked about, I can be standing at the top of that hill with a ball. And if I wanna give you a message, I could write it on a piece of paper, attach it to the ball and let the ball roll down the hill and the ball does the work for me. Or maybe even a better example of this is back in ancient times, if you were going to build a um, flour mill where you grind wheat to make flour, where would you build that flour mill? Next to the wheat yeah. field. Yeah. Well, okay, true, next to the wheat field. You definitely want it next to the wheat field, but where else would you put it? By a river, because you would put a big wheel in that river. And as the oh, water see. moved down the river, it would turn the wheel and you would be able to use the energy of that water to grind your flour, right? That makes sense? Well, that's essentially what we're gonna do here. Notice, remember, as we talked about, Sodium really, really, really wants to come into the cell. So we say, all right, sodium, you really, really, really want to come into the cell? Come on in. 
you can come on in. So sodium, come on in, join the party. If you really wanna come in, come on into the cell. But if you're gonna come in, I need you to do a little work for me. I need you to use your energy to also bring in a glucose or maybe have you bring in an amino acid or something like that with you. I'm using your energy to bring something else inside as well. And we call these SIM porters. Because both molecules move in the same direction. And in fact, not surprisingly, when we use the driving force of one molecule, that one molecule we are most often going to use for this, not always, but the one most commonly used is indeed sodium. But notice I could do something else instead. Instead, I could say, hey, sodium, come on in. You really, really, really wanna come inside, tell you what, you can come on in, Come on in, I will let you come in. But when you come in, I need you to do a little work for me. When you come in, I need you to kick out a calcium ion, or I need you to kick out a, uh, a hydrogen ion. Get rid of that hydrogen. My cell's too uh, acidic. Get rid of that calcium. Uh, it's making my cell do wonky things. It moves it in the opposite direction. And this we call an antiporter. With that antiporter, uh, the both molecules move in opposite directions. All right, you with me so far? We have these sim porters, we have these anti porters. Sim porters, they're both moving in the same direction. Anti porters, oh, I misspelled anti porter. They are moving in opposite directions. But notice I'm using the energy of sodium, I'm not using any ATP. So to me, this doesn't seem like it should be active transport. But let's see how. And again, often when I do this, what I like to do is I like to use completely unrealistic and unreal numbers. If we use simple numbers, it makes simple sense. Let's say for argument's sake, and let's do this in, what color haven't I used yet? We'll use blue. No, oh, no, hold on, I want that to stay black. Let's say for argument's sake, I have 10 sodium outside of the cell. Now, obviously we have millions of sodiums outside of the cell, but we're gonna keep this simple. 10 sodiums outside of the cell, and we have four sodiums inside of the cell. So of course, which way does sodium wanna go based on this? Not a trick inside. Yeah, it wants to go inside, absolutely. So because sodium wants to go inside, I can say, okay, sodium, come on inside and bring in an amino acid with it. Once I've done that, how many sodiums are outside? Nine. Nine. These are the easy questions, folks. How many sodiums are inside? Five. Oh, excellent. So then I use another sodium to kick out a calcium. And how many sodiums are outside? Eight. Eight. And how many sodiums are inside? Six. And now I use another sodium to kick out a hydrogen ion. And how many sodiums are outside? Seven. Seven. And how many sodiums are inside? Seven. Does sodium want to come inside anymore at this point? No. 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 And notice if it doesn't want to come inside anymore, I can't get it to do work for me anymore. 
And now my sim porters and my anti porters aren't going to work. So when a sodium comes inside, when I have this sodium that comes inside of the cell with my sim porter, what do I need to do to that sodium? Do I want it to stay inside the cell? No. No, I need to kick it out. I need to use some type of sodium pump to kick that sodium out. And if I'm gonna use a sodium pump to kick that sodium out, what do I need to get that sodium pump to work? An ATP. I need ATP. Yeah. Oh, ATP. <laughs> yeah. So notice I need, so notice these secondary active transporters don't directly use ATP. But if I don't use that ATP to kick that sodium right back out, they won't continue to do their job. So notice, as I mentioned, they're not directly using ATP, but they're indirectly using ATP. Without ATP to maintain our concentration gradient, then I can't get, I can't get these symporters to continue to work. So ATP doesn't bind to the secondary active transporters at all. But if I don't have ATP somewhere in the cell working with primary active transporters to get that sodium out, they won't continue to work. And that's why they're considered active membrane transporters because without the use of ATP, they can't do their work. These over here on the left, these passive, ATP doesn't matter at all. The cell could have no ATP and these passive membrane transporters will continue to work. The same is not true for these co-transporters. Again, I've done a nice, oops, wrong button. Wanted to save that. A nice job of drawing this, but let's look at the pretty pictures from your textbook. Again, this is a mediated or facilitative which is just a fancy way of saying that it needs proteins, but it's active. And again, now we can be more specific of what active means. Active means that it is either directly or indirectly using ATP. And if we're using ATP, Typically, we're doing it to move things against their concentration gradients. And probably the biggest example of this is our sodium-potassium pump. Two types of active transport, primary and secondary. Secondary active trans pump are our co-transporters. So they often indirectly require ATP. And there are two types, symporters and antiporters. Symporters, again, both move in the same direction. And with an antiporter, both move in the opposite direction. Now, I've done some pretty simple illustrations of this. I love this picture from your textbook because it does a great job of actually showing how the sodium potassium ATPase works. Notice here's our protein, here's our transporter. Our three, let's do it this way. Sodium ions come and bind in it. And then we split an ATP rip off that phosphate, use the energy. And notice here, we use the energy to change the shape of the molecule, All right? This is the difference between facilitated diffusion and active transport. Here it is actually that we're using the energy to change the shape. And now it's open at the top instead of the bottom. And so as a result of that, our sodium can be released and it can load up with two potassium. Once the energy is expelled and the phosphate goes away, 
it goes back to its original shape. The potassium comes in and now it's ready to be loaded with sodium again. So notice one ATP kicks three sodium out and brings two potassium in. Here, we see some examples of some secondary active transporters. Remember, we need something to do work for us. And in this case, that something to do work is sodium. Sodium really, really, really wants to come inside the cell. So we say, okay, sodium, you can come in, come on in, whoops. You can come on in, but when you come in, you gotta kick out a calcium. Or when you come in, you have to kick out a hydrogen. Remember, these are what we call our antiporters when they're moving in opposite directions. Or we say, okay, sodium, you can come in, but bring in a glucose with you. You can come in, but bring in an amino acid with you. And notice this is an example of what we called a symporter, moving the molecules in the same direction. I had a question. Yes. Um, for the primary transport on basically between two and three, so it uses the phosphate in order to do the conformational change to get the potassium inside. Uh, not exactly. Remember, as we talked about, and I'll draw this really simply, we have our sugar, we have our nitrogen base, right? An adenine nitrogen base with the ribose sugar. And remember, ATP has one, two, three phosphates connected to it. When we split the ATP, we are breaking this bond. And breaking that bond, remember, releases the energy. Mm -hmm. So when the phosphate binds and we rip it off, we release the energy. And that energy changes its shape. And that energy is spent. What actually happens is when the two potassiums come in and bind, they actually then kick that spent phosphate off. They kick off the phosphate that's not needed anymore. And when the phosphate goes away, it goes back to its original shape. Okay. Okay. I have a question. Yes. Um, why are there three sodiums expelled and two potassiums? Like, because why are like, the, where the way numbers God come? wants it. Oh, so they just, okay, there's no reason. It's just that's. As we've talked about, why is always one of those questions that can be challenging for us to answer. Uh, why? is not clear, but remember, as we mentioned, one of the advantages of it is that there is more positive stuff outside the cell than inside. And again, that makes the inside of the cell more negative at that negative 70 millivolts, that resting membrane potential that is so important for the cell to do work. So why it was originally set up this way, I don't have an answer for you, but does it help the cell to function properly? Absolutely. And we'll see that as we continue on further with more and more functions of cells, like when we get to the nervous cells, when we get to the muscle cells and things like that. We'll see just how important that membrane potential is. All right. Any other questions? All right. Excellent. With that, we are done with all of the lecture we needed to cover for today. But as I talked about, that is not all we are going to do. Uh, what we are going to do next is our, hold on, let me get rid of that and get rid of that, our practice lab exam. So let's talk about this practice lab exam. I think I saved this, but just in case I'll do it again. There are no points for this practice lab exam. This is solely for you to understand the process and to self-check how you're preparing. If you get 100% on this practice exam, does that mean that you don't have to study for the next two weeks? No. 
No, of course not. But you can take comfort in the fact that knowing that you are studying the material in the correct fashion, and as long as you continue to keep doing what you're doing, you can be successful on the real one. If on the other hand, you get none of the 20 questions correct, should you go grab a belt and go to the bathroom and flog yourself with that belt afterwards? No, of course not. But uh, what you should do is realize that the good news is we have 13 days before the next exam. And what that means is maybe you're not studying the material in the right way. So you need to attack this material differently. And conveniently enough, right after class today, I have office hours. So if you do really poorly on this and you're really struggling and you're not sure what you can do, come to my office hours and we can discuss it. Because the good news is you have time to modify your study behavior and your study habits to help you to be successful. Now, as I mentioned, this is going to be the exact format for the real ex uh, lab exam. I will be honest, this is not my preferred format for the lab exams. For a lab exam online, I would prefer you have all the questions presented to you at once. So you could order them, you can answer them in any order that you want. Maybe when you get down to 25, you realize you answered three wrong. And so you can go back up and answer, change the answer of three and all of that. However, from a year and a half of doing this online, I have found that that format, unfortunately, doesn't work well for a fair number of students. It takes it, it, too much stress on their internet, too much stress on their RAM. And so their computers crash or they're not able to do it. So even though there are set requirements you're supposed to have, in the interest of compatibility, what is gonna happen is they will be presented one at a time. Now, you have the ability, if you get to answer 25, to go back to question three to be able to answer it again and change it. There is a little uh, key on the side which will allow you to bounce back and forth. Uh, but so technically you can still go back, but you will get the questions presented one at a time. Treat this like the real exam. Try to get your area uh, empty of space. Again, as we were talking at the beginning of class, if you have a monitor uh, for a real exam, make sure it's covered. If you don't wanna take the time to cover it or move it or turn it around for this, that I will accept. Uh, but there's no reason you can't clear your material uh, off of your desk, have all your smart devices and everything else put away, uh, food and drink and stuff like that put away. Treat this like you would a real exam. And as I mentioned, all of these are real questions. Every single one of these questions is a question I've asked on a previous exam. And a fair number of these are actually uh, present on your, uh, in your test banks for this coming test. So you may see these questions again. All right, there are a total of 20 questions. I've given you guys a full 30 minutes to be able to complete this. So as soon as I'm done talking right here, and if there aren't any questions, I will open up the quiz. Uh, go ahead, you can uh, uh, go ahead and leave uh, the Zoom to because again, that just puts more strain on your RAM. Go ahead and leave the Zoom. I will leave the class up. If there's any problems, you can come back, but uh, go ahead and take that. And then we will meet back here because uh, I want to go over it together. So let's say, uh, I want to continue talking, but let's come back and we will meet at, uh, we'll go ahead and do 12. That should give us 30 minutes to go through it. That should be fine. So if you finish a little bit early, uh, then go ahead and take a little bit of a break and come back on to Zoom here at noon. Uh, and we will go over the exam together, talking about it and what you're responsible for. All right. Questions on any of that? Yes, you have to use Chrome, you have to have your Proctorio set up, you have to do all of those things the exact same way you would do a normal test. This is the exact same format of a real exam. All right, any other questions? All righty. Your practice lab, ex lab exam is now available. So please leave Zoom. Uh, go take your quiz and I will meet you back here at noon.
again, please don't stay here while you're taking it. I find that if you do that, it puts too much of a strain on your RAM. So the best thing to do is to uh, close the Zoom, come back after, and uh, go take the test. The two, three, go, take the quiz. Don't stay here. Crystal, is there a reason you came back? Yeah, it said something about needing a, um, a password. So that means you don't have your Proctorio set up properly. So uh, on your tabs, there should be a, uh, what's the tab say? Uh, the tab says um, secure exam proctor. Make sure oh, okay. you click that ex uh, a secure exam proctor button. For whatever reason, sometimes Proctorio uninstalls itself, so you have to just install it again. So click that button, install Proctorio, and you'll be able to take it. Okay, that's what, it looks like that's what happened. All right, All right thank you. Perfect. Yep, you're welcome. Yeah. Bree, are you still there? Are you there? Are you asleep? Go take the test. Don't be here on Zoom. <laughs> 